guys, Marty Schwartz here with Marty Music. We got another episode of Guitar Tours, and I am so excited to have the amazing Hunter Hayes here, multi-platinum selling artist, five-time Grammy Award nominee, and connoisseur of fine things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll take that all day long. <laughs> so nice to have you here, and thank you, by the way, for you know taking the time out and talking guitars. Is that man? Yeah, or anything you want to talk about, <laughs> man. Thanks for considering me for this. I obviously see you as a, a, a connoisseur of fine things uh. myself, and so this is a real treat. Anything that gets me away from working for a couple hours and yeah. talking about guitars, too. Yeah, I'm totally yes, in. yes. Yeah, so. This is guitar tour, so we're gonna show and tell guitars, and That's, so yeah. we've got this beautiful guitar here. And and what's the story on that? I found my way to Strat World. Yeah. Yes. Right. When I started studying guitar players, a buddy of mine gave me two CDs. He gave me an Allman Brothers record and a Stevie Ray Vaughan record. And that was like my introduction to like proper guitar playing. I loved the harmonies and the musicality of the Allman Brothers stuff. Yeah, yeah. But I loved the expressiveness and the attitude of the Stevie Ray Vaughan stuff. Rude mood. Exactly. <laughs> and then I, like every guy that plays a Strat, will mention John Mayer and we'll just, we'll move on. I'm a huge fan <laughs> and that's, that goes without saying. But, so I, I found my way to Strats and really got comfortable in that world. And all the guitar players that I was studying too, back in Louisiana, were all playing, you know, steel guitar parts on Cajun songs, right? Yeah, so, okay. Literally that. Neck yeah, yeah. pick up Strat through a, like a PV Classic 30. So okay. that was the tone I was in love with. That's what I wanted. And so I, I've been chasing that ever since. Actually, my first Ernie Ball Music Man guitar that I played was a Steve Lukather model. Oh, yeah. And even though that is the farthest thing <laughs> from all of those things that I love, I fell in love with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, was re I loved the ease of it. It was kind of like, I felt like cheating. It was too yeah, easy yeah. to play. The tension or the way that the headstock's designed totally changed the game for me. And then they had a, a Strat lookalike that they had sent for me to try. And honestly, I was at a distance from it for a second. I didn't yeah, yeah. want to try it because I wasn't like, I'm, I wasn't a believer. I was so dead wrong. <laughs> so dead wrong. And I fell in love with what is called the Cutlass. Okay. I ordered another Cutlass and we started talking about, hey, maybe we should design one together. And through three years of prototypes and trying new things and trying random things, we ended up with this. And it's the color of the, the Strat that one of my favorite guitar players, Turtle, is what he's called. Kevin Carmay used to play this, uh, like a Lake Placid Blue-ish kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The goal was a Tele Bridge on a Strat body. Brass. So no, we're not doing no... Uh... I hate... Yeah, I hate it. Yeah. I know that I'm going to get so many rude comments from all these people watching on YouTube. No, we're good, care. we're good. But brass saddles, this has got a piezo output, which I really love. Oftentimes we'll take that separately on another wireless pack. Okay. Run through a Jerry Douglas Aura and do like resonator parts. Oh, okay. Or okay. acoustic parts. Yeah, yeah. When, super clean, super right, crispy. Yeah. Or you can roll it in with the magnetic pickup or just have the magnetic pickups, which is... Is, is that what the switch is? So this switch is actually a boost. So this is out of oh. Lukather's guitar. I stole this. Okay. It's the 22 dB boost and it's, it's mid-range, like, it's very EQ'd. So okay. it's a very pointy boost. It's not super weighted. I hate when amps just start feeling like they're just gonna fall apart. Uh, that's the, For me, I, I want the attack. What's the concept if, behind using it? The goal was, honestly, it replaces, if I if I can go play a gig, apart from having a delay pedal, which is like my, like, I can't live without it, I can literally just go play a gig without a pedal board, you know? You can... <laughs> had all of it there, right? So on the bridge pickup, we did a we did a thing where we just blend the neck pickup in with the bridge pickup on, uh, on the last volume knob. Okay. So there's actually no tone knobs on this. They're all volume knobs. Okay. So were you not a tone controller anyway? You know, I am. You know, honestly, I don't use it live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I rarely use it live. If I'm if I'm gonna go for that effect, I, I'm gonna use a pedal for that. I want something else to do it. I want my hands to be here and not kind of working with it. In the studio, I'll use it all the time. Right. But live, I never use it. And yeah, it's all locking tuners and the roasted maple neck. And, and, and did we say this is the signature? This is the signature. Yeah, but the Cutlass is a... Uh, is an Ernie Ball model that they've been making for, for a while now. But this and is like a Cutlass turned into... This is everything I need in yeah. a single guitar to go play play a one-off gig. Nice. You know, I never thought I'd be that guy because I, I like having options. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this has a lot of options and I, I, I was really impressed with their uh, their willingness to try things with me. And we tried and failed on a few things. Well, that's, but we got here. Yeah. So. That's what you want though in yeah. a partnership. What, what's the point 100%. otherwise, right? Yeah, totally. You want that thing that is you. Yeah. Personified. All the annoying bits about the way that I play and what I want, <laughs> I still I still want them. And they're, I got they you. all exist in and one place. How old were you when you started playing guitar? So I got my first guitar when I was six. Parents, um, dad plays dad guitar? Or? No, nobody in my family played any music whatsoever. I think made it really easy for me as far as like discovery. Yeah. Because it was all my discovery, you know what I mean? It wasn't really a, a taught or a encouraged thing. or It was just all, I want to try this and I want to experiment. And so it was, there, there's freedom in music for me because of that very quality. And I, okay. I love that. And my parents were 
supportive. So I had the best of both worlds. I had supportive parents. Yeah. Even though I was a musician. <laughs> and, and, um, and I, but I had the freedom to, to find it myself and make it my own. Is there one moment where you were like, this, this is what I want to be like or this is what I want to yeah, do? Yeah, I mean, you know, they brought a lot of things into my world that because of how I grew up and what I grew up around, I would have never been introduced to. Okay. Not in a bad way, just in a, yeah. you know, what my, my dad was listening to, what we were listening to as a family. Listening to his music really kind of brought a lot of the influences that I was begging for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To an approachable way. Yeah. And a very easy starter conversation. Yeah. And then led me to more Stevie Ray Vaughan, more Jimi Hendrix. And there was a video that he did with Derek Trucks. That's what introduced me to Trucks. Right now, if I were to say, like, if I could pull from anybody, I like threes. Mayor, Trucks. And Edge. Oh yeah, I was I was hearing uh, the yeah. delay vibe that you were doing too. Yeah. Is the signature guitar available for other people? To... It will be soon. Yeah. And we're Not gonna do yet. a couple different versions. My biggest thing was obviously I wanted like the tricked out trickster version, but I also wanted a version. And Sterling and I talked about this. And we went round and round about how we were gonna do it. The compromise was the biggest issue. But you know, one of my favorite guitar players, Devin Malone, his belief mm -hmm. was you should be able to get a great amp, a great guitar, great, not just good, but excellent. If you know where to look under a thousand dollars, there's no reason you should have to spend over a thousand dollars to get something great. Right. And so that was kind of one of the things that we talked about. And obviously the Sterling models have always kind of had that quality, but our biggest thing was how do we make something under a thousand dollars that's also gonna have the certain pieces that really give this its voice. Yeah, yeah. Right, so we, we talked about it and we've got a few different versions of that and we'll announce those as well. Man, it was so cool hearing about your influences, checking out your signature guitar. Maybe we could uh, hear you play it a little more since it's your yeah. baby there. Let me kind of mess around with something. Okay, I, yeah, I please, I an idea. please. Thanks for showing us your uh, signature guitar there. Yeah, man, absolutely. And so now we have another guitar that's yeah. part of your fleet. Man, as of late, yeah. I went to a guitar store to look for a thin line telly because I really wanted a thin line telly. I also realized in, in the shopping process how picky I am. <laughs> and going back to the Devin Malone comment, I'm always looking for anything under that thousand dollar mark because there's always something just golden hanging out somewhere waiting yeah, yeah. to be picked up and, and loved. I saw this hanging on the wall. I think it was like 700 bucks and it just intrigued me because of the fact that it had one pickup. I think I've played it through a deluxe, which is how I fall in love with anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I loved it so much because it was like a simpler version of a Strat. I played it all over. We did like a Christmas project at the, in the last year and this is the only guitar that I played the entire time. This is like a 70s-ish model. I've two now because I, fought, I fell in love with it and I bought another one. Longer scale, standard fender scale necks with the magic of this weird bridge that you can't really bend notes on, which okay. I love. Okay. Um, I'm past like a whole note. Once you go past the whole note, just forget to let go. But I, I love the snappiness of it. I love the, the sort of the low output of the, the, the pickup, but also kind of the mid rangey quality of the pickup is really nice. Okay. I do love this guitar and it ended up being one of my favorites and it's it's all over the new album for that reason. Because it is so simple to, to grab, play a solo and create on without sort of thinking of a, a lot of steps in between. Well, that reminds me, you said new album. Yes, please ask me about my new album. <laughs> 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 Not because I want to promote it, I just, I love talking about it. No, I, I would love to hear about it. What's the story on that? The only reason I said that was because it's been my favorite process I've ever had. Uh, Creative process, yeah. writing and going through the whole that whole arc of the living writing, process creating and has been my favorite okay. part of all of it. It was, you know, three years of an exhausting, heavily filtrated writing process and basically a bunch of bull. And <laughs> I decided at the end, at the beginning of 2018 that I, I was like, man, I, I'm not making any good music this way. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if anybody else likes it. I hate it. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't hate it. There was a lot of songs that I loved, but I also felt like there was a lot missing and there's nobody to blame but me at the yeah, end of the yeah. day. So I settled on an album name like in January, 2018. January 11th, I wrote that as a title track. The second song I wrote was a song called One Shot, which was the first time I'd written by myself in years. And I wrote a few songs for this record by myself, which I had so many insecurities about doing and was really glad that I allowed myself to do it with the assumption that nobody would ever hear it. And normally I write like, you know, 150 to 200 songs 
for a record. And I had already, and I, I just scrapped 200. At least, yeah. And I scrapped all of it and started over, and that's how we ended up with this album. And the best part about it is, there's a lot of like demo material, which means like I'm in somebody's house in their home studio, and we sing the vocal, we keep that vocal, we play a guitar solo, we keep that guitar solo, we keep the acoustic part that so-and-so played, and it's not like this, hey, let's go track it in a fancy recording okay. studio. It's very spur of the moment, and then the rest of the recording is basically done at my house. If it's a garage with a bunch of <laughs> thrown in it, okay. and a bunch of mics, and a bunch of stuff that I love. And, and so a lot of the process is, is literally just me having, you know, Sam will come over to work on a track, and we'll grab a couple of cups of coffee, the dogs will run down the stairs with us to the basement, we turn the lights on, we turn the rig, and we just start splattering paint. It makes sense, especially, you know, you've been at it a long time, so you have to, like, find that creative spark. Yeah. That's what we're here for. Amen. Ultimately. Yeah. And we're here for guitars, so can we hear this thing? And uh, yeah. you do your thing, man, I just want to hear it. Okay. All right. So we checked out a couple electrics. Now I see we have this beautiful looking parlor guitar. What, what do we got here? It's a Martin, right? Yes. When I was making my second record, I went out and saw it. I'm a big fan of Koa wood. I played one in a shop in Seattle and I fell in love with it. And it was a single lot. And that's where I learned about the single lots and the double lots, the triple lots. That's why the custom is a single lot with Koa. Anyway, we'll get <laughs> that later. But so I found this 1929 double lot all Koa, and I loved it, but for some reason it just never sounded good being recorded. It always sounded good in the room, and I love the lack of bottom end on some acoustics, because a lot of times in recordings that it just ends up too boomy, and I don't want the overtones, I wanna hear the crisp mid-range, like basically like 500 and up is all I want out of an acoustic in a lot of scenarios. Even solo, because I feel like it's more expressive that way. It's less weighed down. There's not as much uh, sound waves hitting the ears anyway. I fell in love with this guitar, but I, I played it so little. Ended up making the dumbest decision of my life to sell it. And when I went to sell it the first time, I went through several phases of going to sell it. Because again, it was just kind of a different chapter for me and I, I just was like, you know what, I'm gonna sell this and, and invest it in things that I, I want right now. First time I went, this was sitting at Carter Vintage and it's a single aught 1927. And this was like four, even five years ago. And I played it and I liked it, but it needed some serious setup work. And so I was like, you know what, I'll keep mine. I went back around and I finally was just like, you know what, I just need to sell this. And so I sold, I sold it, this was gone. I went on a couple of trips to a little island in the middle of the ocean that I fell in love with and, and there's a big obsession around Koa because obviously it's, you know, it's the Hawaiian wood. Yeah. And so I fell back in love with it and realized, you know what, I need to find an old Koa acoustic because I miss it. I had just gotten back, it was a Sunday night, I walked into Carter with 20 minutes before they closed and I thought to myself, if I see one, it's all Koa, I'll play it, I'll make a decision in five minutes. And I saw this one and it was the one, but it had been purchased, set up, fixed up, and then put back into Carter's catalog. I love how just light it is, not only in obviously just carrying weight because it's so you know old, but I love the Koa, I love the tonality of it. It's a very humble sounding guitar, mm -hmm. I guess is the best way to describe it. Seemingly quiet, but it can also, it can scream when you when you want it to, it, but this is just all over the new record. You answered my question before I asked all it. All over the new <laughs> record, yeah. Because nice. I'm in love with it. And you write on it? I have written on it a little bit because like the writing process, I kind of tied that up and finished that last year. Okay. I bought this at the beginning of this year. Okay. Um, so this is kind of, this honestly for me is a big deal because it represents seeking out something that that you're you're really passionate about. Honestly, I feel like the Lord kind of just showed this guitar to me a couple of years ago and then just put it back into my life this year. And it, it just goes to show you that some things just take time. Yeah. And sometimes you're not ready for them when you think you are. Well, can we uh, yeah, play if you, Yeah, sure. That's what we're here for. Want to hear it? Thank you. 
We have switched out of the guitar world. Potential cover zone. Is this zone. mandolin tours? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to give it away, but I'm looking at the uh, pick guard there, and we've got yeah. something uh, special here, huh? Obviously, I'm not a mandolin player, but I do love mandolin. I've always loved mandolin. I got to jam on a back porch that sounds made up, but I swear it's not. <laughs> a buddy of mine is really good friends with every country artist that comes into Lafayette, Louisiana. He owns a bed and breakfast in my hometown, Bayou Boudin. He just is notorious for bringing together everybody. He just, he's really good at setting up an environment where people can jam and he hosts, you know, music jams. He's not a musician himself, but he'll host a jam on a, you know, out, outdoors or on the back screened in porch or whatever at this at bed and breakfast. And he gets to know every, every major artist that comes through town. One night, Hank Williams uh, Jr. Was, was in town and, and I went to jam with him and I had a, a giant acoustic guitar that I was kind of trying to get my hands around and figure out how to play. And he said, you need something smaller. A couple weeks later, I got this in the mail, because that's normal, yeah. and that happens. Totally normal. So looking back, it's like I had the weirdest childhood. Anyway, and on the pick guard, it says Hunter Hayes from Hank Williams Jr. As if that's not crazy enough, this came on the road with me. But being that this was always on the bus in the back studio, I always have like a little studio set up on the bus. We had a bus fire several years ago that I wasn't on the bus for, and thankfully my driver was okay, but he was hauling it across the country, and in the middle of nowhere, it the engine caught fire, and that's how, uh, underneath everything that I had in there. And so when I got the call the, that morning, they just said, you know, it's a total loss, you know, bring whatever you need, like we're, you're, you know, starting over, everything yeah. in there was gone. And I started taking inventory of all the things that were in that back lounge, and there was a, a, one of the strats that my buddy had given me when I was a kid, there was this, there was a 1958 Fender Champ. So I'd kind of like had my moment. Obviously, you know, everybody's fine, so you can't complain, you can't cry about it, you know? But I was a little right. bummed. Lo and behold, we stopped into Salt Lake City on that tour like a month or two months later. One of our guys in the crew came back from the bus with everything that was in the back lounge. The Champ still works, the uh, electric is fine, and this was also in that fire and it came back like this. The fire had gone basically all the way around that back room and a lot of things that were sort of in the center of the room were actually made it out. It's a total miracle, and I, I love that it came back to me. And it's now it's like you got to cherish it's like, it now. It's and like, what's really cool, and I, I don't know what to do about it because I don't know if there's a way to preserve it, but there's something kind of like fuzzy, distorted about the pickup now. Oh, okay. It's got this really cool, like <laughs> almost like an octafuzz pedal. Okay. I don't want to switch it out because <laughs> yeah. it sounds too cool. You yeah. know, I can't play it live for that reason, but right, right. I honestly don't even want to take it on the road anymore yeah, for yeah. obvious reasons. But yeah, so that I, I just, I don't know. I, I love that this thing has, has had such a history. Wow. You ever uh, mess with like bluegrass? Man, I'm such a big fan of that world and those sounds. And I, I think that's part of what I try to craft every song with. And I've, I've always been a huge Punch Brothers fan. Everybody, I feel like, knows that about me by now. Yeah. I'm a huge Chris Thiele fan. Yeah, yeah. You hung out with Chris Thiele, played with him or anything? I, I've hung out with him a few times. That's probably the most fangirling I have ever, <laughs> ever done. I met him actually the same year that I met John at a, John Mayer, at a Grammy. John. At a series of Grammy <laughs> things, yeah. So John, the first year I was there, nominated for a new artist. And correct, congratulations, man. Thank you I mean, for that, such man. The nomination's a big deal for me. It, it, uh, it should be. He came running into my dressing room, and it was just me and him chatting. And he was like, "Are you nervous? Are you freaking out?" And, you know, and he was making fun of me for being nervous, <laughs> you know, and which I loved. And he was just like, "Dude, you know, don't worry about it." And he just, I don't know, his approach to the whole thing was very matter of fact and very shrugging it off, and you know, in a way of like, remember this is a part of your story, not like you know, the, the nerves are coming from this is the first time. But you know, he was very encouraging and very like, you know, you've got a long road, you've got a long story to build, and, and yeah. th that kind of approach, which I think I needed to hear from somebody who's you know who's been doing. It for a while. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know? And definitely one of one of your uh, idols or something sure. you, you look up to. You wanna just play it a little more? Yeah, I'll try.
all right, we were in the acoustic pretty zone, and that, that was awesome. Oh, well, we've got time for one more, yeah. and we're going to go back into the electric world, right? And so we've got another music man here. How is this different than your signature? Honestly, tuning. I just, I'm a whole oh. down on this. When you write songs and sing them at 19, and then you go back to sing them at 27, you tend to change the keys a little bit, <laughs> okay, you know, hopefully okay. without anybody noticing. So this is just a, a whole step down. So I play this a lot during the show, but I love the sort of classic color combination. It's a bit of a Clapton, you know, to the hat. Also a tip of the hat to Edge a little bit as well. This is just kind of a slightly modified version of the signature model. But yeah, this is probably what's going to like start the show. It's a little bit more country. And speaking of touring, yes. you've got giant tour coming up. Man, I am so excited. You know, last year was a good year and we worked hard on getting this album done. And right now we're finishing the recording process. It's all to get on the road for me. Yeah. It's all with the idea that I, with the goal of being on the road. We finally have announced our Closer to You tour. Closer to You tour. I'm really excited about it. It's the beginning of many things. This is a, a really exciting thing for me. This is a proper start from scratch. Okay. Uh, production, uh, musically, we're doing a lot of new music from the album. It's a lot of things that I've been wanting to do. You know, we didn't get as much time last year to design a show. We kind of had to just keep our show together and play. Keep working, and, keep and working. Keep, yeah, keep we're working. This was a chance for me to take this album and turn it into a show which I haven't done in probably five, six years. So here we are. This is the beginning of that. Well, so people can check out that tour, but in the meantime, you, this one's coming on tour? Oh, yeah. So can we give them a little taste? For sure, yeah, All right. absolutely. I've had such a thrill today, Hunter. Thank you again, man. It's I'm geeking out, I'm having a good time, and Dude, thank, thank you, you again, really. Thank you for having and, me. I really thanks, appreciate man. It. And then also, real quick, the single is called Heartbreak. So we're gonna have a link down there for it. Also, you've got your uh, spring tour. So we're gonna leave a link down there for you guys to be able to get tickets. And also, your YouTube channel. You guys, come on, support. Pure talent right here, and uh, hopefully we uh, we both see you again in the future. All right, man, that's all the time we got, but you, you got one more jam in you? Always. <laughs> right? Always. I, I had a feeling. Yeah. <laughs>